So many questions have been handed down. Uh, we won't have time for all of them. I'm pleased to announce that Tetsuro is the winner of the question derby. Uh, <laughs> if you were required to not get your passport back until you'd asked all these questions. Uh, but the first one would be for Julianne, and it, uh, uh, if you can come up. And uh, so if I can link a pair of questions, for instance, can you turn dogs into wolves and can you turn wolves into dogs? Uh, the more formal way of asking the question that was handed down would be, dogs have been bred to respond to human characteristics and behavior, uh, not so far wolves. Uh, question A, what about feral and near, near feral dogs, like the dingo and the canan dog? That's the first part of the question. But then the flip side would be, what would you do with wolves to increase their ability to use social cues? OK, so um, these are interesting questions. So first, about the feral dogs. So we know a little bit about feral dogs. Um, first of all, let's start by saying not all dogs are feral. So the dogs we see on the street are still somehow connected to humans. So there's only one population of dogs that we really um, can be sure of to be really distant from humans, so not in not dependent on humans in any way. So they um, find their own food and they do their own things. Um, <clears throat> it's extremely difficult, if not impossible, to work with these dogs. Um, um, people have tried to work with feral dogs that sort of ended up in a shelter at some point. We found that dogs that have been on the street and then moved to a shelter do still respond to these cues. Other groups have found different results. So this is a debate at the moment, but we have found that feral dogs do also respond um, to these kinds of um, gestures. So this is the first part of the question, I guess. So the second part was about dingoes. So what happens? So dingoes, um, the ancestor of the dingo was a dog. At least that's the hypothesis at the moment. So 5,000 years ago, sort of a, a dog, a, a population of dogs sort of um, became really feral and sort of um, evolved or developed into a new species, the dingo. And people have worked with dingoes. There's not a lot of work, but a little bit. Um, dingoes do use some of the gestures um, like dogs, but not as flexible. So um, that means they do not use the very subtle ones that, that, that also dogs use. They do um, use cues like really pointing, touching, and these kinds of things, but not the more <coughs> subtle ones that um, domestic dog u dogs use. Was that all? Was that the question? Uh, how do you turn a wolf? Thing? Well, how do you turn a wolf into a dog, or what would you have to do um, um, to to sort of uh, make uh, make a dog? Um, well, um, or get this from a wolf? Um, so what you have to do is to domesticate them. Um, and so what domestication did is uh, many things. So one, did is, um, w w one thing it did is selected for a certain temperament. So uh, we know that domestication sort of selected against aggression and fear, and this aggression alone might sort of uh, pave the way for some of the skills that we see in dogs today, okay? So dogs are selected to be nice and friendly um, and cooperative. Um, so this is one thing that, that I would do for sure. So select for, I, th I think the interesting thought experiment, um, of course you can't do it for many ethical reasons, but the interesting thought experiment is what would happen, happen if you would select a chimpanzee or a population of chimpanzees against aggression and fear and what would you get? I think this is a very interesting thought experiment um, to think about. Um, yeah. Does that answer the question? <laughs> okay. Any more? No. So I've, I've selected three uh, for Tetsuro. Um, here's one. If the key aspect of language is portability, uh, the ability to share experiences with relatives and loved ones, isn't this possible evidence against the linguistic ability of chimps, since they appeared not to share these cognitive abilities learned in the lab with others? Or correspondingly, uh, do they uh, have the ability to express these skills and experiences with their peers and be understood. I think it's the contextuality of the text, the test, which is being asked about. First of all, first of all, uh, what I wanted to, to, to point out is what is the language? So it is very clear that people believe 
We are so unique because we have the language. And people often attribute the, this capability to brain function. But uh, in my talk, I wanted to attribute this capability to the social system. So that the language does not stem from symbolic representation or abstract concept, but stem from our society. And the important points I want to tell you is humans are really collaborative uh, because of the way of rearing the children. So as I have explained you, fathers and mothers. Let's go back to the original question. In the case of chimpanzees, they are patrilineal lineage to society. So um, grandfather, father, son stay in the natal community, and all females go out. Reach to the puberty, they go out. And the new young females coming in. So look at the relationship between mother and child. Mother-son, the relationship continues, but the relationship mother and daughter just stop, and the daughters never return to the natal community. So yes, there is a social relationship in chimpanzees, but their way of living is completely different from humans. In human cases, very complex network, and that network continues. So helping each other, so spontaneous uh, altruistic behavior. Um, in the slide, I show mother chimpanzee give a hand to the uh, baby chimpanzee. When the baby chimpanzee needs a help, whimper, ooh, 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 ooh. the mother gives a hand. And in the everyday life, we see human mother give a food to the baby. But in human cases, I'm so surprised to see the infant try to give a food to the mother, right? Uh, strawberry on the plate. Mother give the strawberry to the baby. But the baby wanted to give the strawberry put back to the mother, to the grandmother. So this kind of uh, behavior is really uniquely human. So I do not deny any kind of uh, social relationship and helping behavior in non-human primates and animals, but human is really unique. Don't go away. Hmm. Yeah. So the informal way of asking this question is when you made uh, those very loud sounds in chimpanzees. What were you saying, man? <laughs> um, the more formal way of asking the question was, did it have a meaning? And in particular, did it have a syntax? Oh. Yeah. That was chimpanzee way of greeting. That is called pant food. And the important point is pant food, if you carefully listen or look, the way of producing the sounds, that is So press out, in, out, in, out. Let's try. <laughs> So same, sh same shape of the mouth, but you press out and in. <laughs> the meaning is say hello. <laughs> so 
So one kilometer away, um, the sound reached to one kilometer away, and the chimpanzee can hear the voice. And as we do, I can discriminate the sounds of Ajit from Ralph. So, oh, Ralph is punt footing, so let me join him. Or oh, Ajit is uh, punt footing. Mm. Let's go the other way. <laughs> <laughs> so that is uh, a reality, what, is ha uh, what happens in, in the forest. But uh, to conclude my answer, um, let me go back to the respiration. Out, in, out, in, out, in. Chimpanzee laugh, smile and laugh. But chimpanzee laughing is Chimpanzee makes a, a different kind of uh, voices like hand grunt. <laughs> this is greeting. And chimpanzee makes food call <laughs> to eat something and laughing. <laughs> the context is really the same. Humans and chimpanzee laugh in the very uh, similar way and in the same context. But the way of making the sound is completely different. For you, <laughs> but human <laughs> is less in and out stop, out stop, out stop. <laughs> but chimpanzee laughing is <laughs> Ha, 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 like you, 100 meter dash, and <laughs> So, what is uniquely human? The language, speech, but our speech is featured by the respiration of blessed in and out, stop, out, stop, out, stop. All languages, thousands of natural languages have the common features. Bless in and out, stop, out, stop, out, stop. But all chimpanzee language vocalization is bless out, in, out, in, out, in. <laughs> Laughing. <laughs> Foot call. <laughs> so I think chimpanzee communication is really species specific constraints of their way of <coughs> respiration and making the voice. And human speech is really also spe species specific, and we are very good at control the voice. I have a... a <laughs> so I have a, a third interesting question for you, and then we would switch over to Sarah Jane. Um, Tetsuro, have you considered the performance of chimpanzees on memory tests where chimps beat typical humans with the performance of some autistic savants on similar tasks? If so, any thoughts on how the two domains might interestingly be informed by each other? Wow. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> well, uh, the answer is no. <laughs> um, yes, uh, the chimpanzee performance, memory performance, reminds us of so-called savan, uh, mm, high intelligent autistic uh, people. Uh, I think many of you have seen the movie titled Rain Man, and Dustin Hoffman uh, took the role of, uh, the actor took the role of uh, so-called Saban, and it was the matches scattered on the floor. And he can apparently say, oh, how many matches on the floor? This kind of of capability is amazing, but it is not clear for us the advantage 
of having this kind of capability. And in the case of chimpanzee, uh, I believe this capability of photographic memory or eidetic memory, whatever, is really advantage they have. Uh, for example, suppose that a creature passing in front of you that had a white spot on the forehead and black hairs and brown on the legs. Chimpanzee may have this capability of grasping the creatures at a glance. And we humans cannot do it. And the saban can, chimpanzees and saban can do it, but we humans, typical humans, cannot do it. But we can label this creature like um, antelope. Saban cannot do it. Chimpanzee cannot do it, but humans can do it, make the label. And going back to the camp, that is what I mentioned, portability, and share the experience. Bring back your experience to the camp and share the exper experience by saying, I saw the antelope, or antelope, or pointing, and let's go hunt. So, and hunting, and bring the meat back to the camp and share with the ladies and children. So that is our way of life. So we are the creatures to share. And chimpanzee and saban, as you know in saban, are very difficult in the communication. So chimpanzee is very difficult in the communication in this way, and saban is also difficult. So it's very difficult for them in this level to communicate to each other. But communication is not limited by the speech. Just touching, you can communicate something from bottom of the heart. So this kind of communication is completely different matter. <clears throat> for, for Sarah Jane, before uh, turning over to Terry. So adolescent years are noted for their hormonal changes. Uh, do they affect your results, uh, either at the neural level uh, with respect to pruning, for example, or at the behavioral level, for example, risk taking during social observation? And what sex differences are important in your work? These are excellent questions. Um, so yes, most adolescent uh, research, cognitive neuroscience research, defines the adolescent group by age and not by puberty status or hormone levels. And this is not optimal because if you think about, let's say, a group of 13-year-old girls, a classroom of 13-year-old girls, they're the same age, but they can be very different levels of puberty. That's absolutely normal to have a very large variation of puberty. So you can have one 13-year-old girl who's very early puberty and another 13-year-old girl, even with the same birthday, who's in late stages of puberty. And the question is, what would their brains look like? Would they be the same because they're the same age or would they be different because of their different levels of puberty? And the answer is, well, we've, we've done... we've been doing some research on that. One of my PhD students, Annalisa Goddings, is a pediatrician and her PhD is exactly on that question, how does puberty affect social brain development and risk taking? And the kind of summary <laughs> answer is that both matter. There are dissociable effects of chronological age and puberty and hormonal levels on brain structure and brain function. So age influences some regions of the brain more than puberty. So that means that how long you've been alive influences the structural development and the functional development of some regions of the brain more than how physically mature you are. But for other regions of the brain, it's the opposite way around. How your, your hormone levels and your puberty status influence brain development more than your chronological age. Sex differences. Um, we tend not to look at sex differences. We tend to work with single sex groups, and that's basically to increase 
power of our sample by uh, increasing the hom homogeneity of the sample, making the sample homogeneous. Um, sex difference, the reason why it makes it more, each, the sample more homogeneous is because of the different uh, average onset of puberty in boys versus girls. Boys go through puberty between, I don't know, six months and two years later than girls do on average. Um, so in other words, if you put a load of boys and girls in the same sample in their early adolescence, you're going to add a load of noise to the sample, if, unless you're actually looking at puberty, in which case you'd, you'd measure that difference. Um, so we tend to use single-sex groups. Therefore, not surprisingly, we don't find gender differences because we can't look for them. Um, however, my view on this is that um, the gender differences that are found in brain development, the robust gender differences that are replicated across studies... There are not very many of them, can I just say. Um, the one of them is that uh, brain, some cortical development in early adolescence occurs a little bit later in boys relative to girls. And that's probably because boys go through puberty a little bit later than girls. Um, other than that, it's the gender difference literature in, in my field is a big mess. And I think it's because, you know, there are lots of non-replications. And I think it's because... There probably are gender differences, but actually the overlap between the genders is bigger than the difference. So in order to see those gender differences, you have to have such big samples, and we, we, we tend not to work with big enough samples. Thank you. So I'm going to start with a question for uh, Jason Mitchell, although after hearing Elizabeth Spelke talk, uh, I think she may have a, a, a comment as well. Could you elaborate how social cognition is separate from language processing with reference to mind reading involved when we read about a character in fiction? So this is perfect. I, I wish my uh, graduate student, Diana Tamir, who works in my lab, were, were here to answer this question. Um, there are two ways of cashing out the question. I, I think what the, what, the, what the question asker is asking is about fiction as such. And, I think many of you probably saw a recent report in the New York Times that suggested that reading certain kinds of fiction actually can enhance theory of mind and empathy. We actually have done some work of that kind looking at changes in the brain as a function of fiction reading. And what we find is what you might expect, where regions of the brain that I've been talking about, such as the medial prefrontal cortex, are more active during the reading of fiction than they are during the reading of nonfiction. Um, and it, when we look to see why that's the case, it seems to be a quality. It, the, the fiction in question has to be um, about other people, and in particular, should be about the sort of goings on of their mind or their relationship with other people. So I think this is an interesting question, both in terms of whether we can upregulate theory of mind by having certain kinds of reading experiences. Um, and we're beginning to understand why that should be the case, g given the relation between fiction reading and the brain regions about which I talked earlier. The first part of the question was about language more, um, more generally. So, right, so um, the brain regions associated with theory of mind tend to have very little overlap with brain regions associated with, with language, which um, by and large, tend, depending on which features of language you're interested in, um, tend to be highly left lateralized regions um, in the, along the frontal cortex. So the overlap between language use, especially things like syntax, and the regions associated with theory of mind is actually quite, quite low. So I, the, the, the connection with Lucy Spelke is that apparently in humans and early uh, development of the first few years of life when language is developing, that this may enhance theory of mind, but even through some sort of connection between two brain areas or more brain areas that don't have in other species as much of a direct connection. Um, question for Michael Arbib. Are, mirror, are there mirror neurons that fire in response to observing death or serious injury? Well, the strict definition of mirror neurons is that they fire both when you do it and when you see somebody else do it. So I am, I am confident that there are no examples of mirror neurons for death. Uh, serious injury, you're probably tapping there the, the empathy system, the, the feeling of pain. And yes, there are recordings there for what you might call mirror regions for pain.
This is a question for uh, Ralph Adolphs or Jessica Somerville. Um, okay, you'll have to fight us out. <laughs> um, is it, th it seems th uh, that theory of memory is sufficient to infer states of being in other minds uh, online. But is it sufficient to allow us to infer the past or history for these minds or to predict a future for these minds? Do we need something else? <laughs> well, uh, it, 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 it's, it's about prediction. Uh, you, s someone's angry. Uh, what do you infer about that person's character, right? Which is a longer term um, judgment. Or how that person will uh, 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 react to something that you're about to tell them in the future. I think Jessica should take Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to make sure I heard the first part of the question properly. Was it about the mirror neuron system specifically? Is that what was being no, asked? No, no, no. The... This is about theory of mind. It's oh, right. Well, yeah, theory of mind broadly construed, right? It refers to our ability to use a host of mental states to understand behavior. So, so that would involve. Um, going into the future and thinking into the past. But I think if we were uh, going to talk about kind of subsystems of theory of mind, it may be the case that the mirror neuron system is really dealing with action more as it unfolds and, and may not be able to be used for um, a sort of simulation type process offline. Yeah. OK, question for Elizabeth Spelke. Um, is direct gazer uh, a precursor to the value of eye contact in later years, especially when shared or mirrored by two individuals? Speculating. I actually think that all of the things that we find in very young infants in the social domain are likely to be shared by us as adults. Uh, direct gaze, I think, remains a sign of social engagement, for better or for worse, right? Being stared at uh, can be a threat or, uh, or an invitation, but I think it always evokes in us a reaction of someone is engaging with me. Um, I also think uh, in that beautiful soccer photograph that Sarah Jane showed, where everybody's going like this, that this, this tendency to mirror other imp socially important people's gestures, not, not necessarily their instrumental actions, but their gestures uh, also is something that stays with us throughout life. The reason I say I'm speculating is because in domains like number and geometry, there's actually research that has tested that hypothesis by looking to see, for example, whether uh, brain areas that are activated uh, uh, during processing of tasks that are given to infants also, uh, also are activated in adults under the same circumstances and showing the same behavioral patterns. And I think that enterprise has gone uh, advanced less far uh, thus far in, in uh, studying social cognitive development. But my guess would be that many of these things that we find in infants continue to be uh, at work in us. <laughs> <laughs>